Okay, I'm recording. Good afternoon. Delmer and I uh, are here today in room 111, 112. It's Friday afternoon, 2 o'clock, and we are recording the Adult School of Ministry lesson number 9 for Sunday, January the 31st, 2021. Today's lesson is entitled, Jesus Confronts Religious Leaders, and He Confronts Errors and Legalism with an authority like the leaders had never seen before. And so uh, a great lesson today coming from Mark chapter 2 and the beginning verses of Mark chapter 3. Before we go into the lesson in detail, let me make a few announcements. Um, there, have, uh, there have been uh, a couple changes since Wednesday night if you, if you were here or you've read the uh, announcements online. Uh, we are asking you to sign a petition to stop the right to abortion amendment uh, to the Virginia Constitution. Uh, you can stop by the CareNet baby bottle table in the lobby to sign the petition, uh, or you can sign the petition online at vshl.org. That is the Virginia Society for Human Life.org. Also, uh, DCA. Uh, has a car wash, auto bell, and cruise through car wash uh, gift certificates available for purchase at $20 a piece before and after services in the lobby on Sunday and also in the uh, DCA school office Monday through Friday from 8 to 4. They can only accept cash or check uh, for those. Also, uh, the Davidson family is much better. And WOW Kids Services will be back online this next Wednesday, February the 3rd, and they will be back live in the building with Kids Services on Sunday, February the 7th during the 11 a.m. service. Pastor Terry has made a change in the USDA food distribution time. It is now going to be on the second Thursday of each month. Uh, instead of the third Thursday. So it's U USDA is now on the second Thursday of the month, and that will begin in February, and it'll be between 1 and 3 p.m. Also, we have door hangers, the Need Prayer door hangers available if you would like them. And also, this Sunday is the last Sunday for the Baby, baby Bottle Campaign with CareNet. Uh, you can drop them off uh, Sunday. Please bring all your bottles back uh, Sunday. Of course, by the time you hear this, it will already have already uh, expired. But if you didn't come Sunday, uh, you can still turn those in. I'm sure they're going to accept them uh, anytime you get them here. So thank you so much for that. Also, um, you can uh, scan the QR code that you'll find on the flyers throughout the building uh, to see our uh, church uh, bulletin. Also, uh, our next clothing closet giveaway will be on February the 6th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. over at Campus 2. Uh, and um, uh, we've had uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, material to give away. Hats, belts, shoes, clothing of all sizes from infants all the way up to adults are available. So thank you so much for that. And then also, um, one, this is, we're quickly approaching the parent and child dedication service uh, on Sunday, February the 7th. So if you haven't signed up to do that, please do that uh, quickly so we can get you the book in the mail. Also, uh, remember that we are doing registration right now for our marriage seminar called Vertical Marriage. That will be on Saturday, February the 13th from 845 until about 330 in the sanctuary. The cost is $20 per couple or $10 per single. You may pick up the workbooks in the lobby on the day of the seminar. We will not have childcare available for this. You can register online at wowcenter.org or you can uh, attend in person and or you can uh, register, watch and attend the service uh, live stream. All right, those are our announcements. We want to pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the Word today and the time in the Word. We have several families who have lost loved ones. Um, uh, Lucy Parker's funeral was Monday. Um, we also had a service for um, uh, Pat uh, Wilson's uh, father. And then also today's 
Uh, Pat Washington's service was today. Uh, 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 Ardelia Evans' uh, husband's service was this past Monday as well. So we just ask that you would remember these families in your prayer. And then we have others that have uh, are getting over COVID and others have had some knee replacements and other surgeries this week. So we just want to pray the Lord's blessing on them and, of course, this lesson today. Father, we thank you for the goodness of God, the faithfulness, Lord, to us, your faithfulness to us, Lord, your provision to us, your spiritual care for us. Father, Lord, as we, we will see that point even brought out in this lesson today, I pray, Father, Lord, that, that you would touch those that are sick, touch those that are ill, touch those, Lord, that are spiritually sick, that need you, that need salvation. We pray, Father, that you would minister to the needs of your people Father, Lord, those requests that we've called by name, the many families that have lost loved ones, Father, Lord, or others that are at the point of death, we pray, Lord, that you would comfort with your peace. Holy Spirit, bless them. And uh, Father, Lord, just meet their needs and provide for them, Father, Lord Jesus, in their soul, their spirit. Father, Lord, if there's any, Lord, in our family and our loved ones, we pray for those that are not saved that don't have a, a faith relationship with you. We pray that they would come to the knowledge of Christ. We pray that maybe some that will hear this lesson would be challenged and encouraged, Father, to ask for forgiveness and to seek you. Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the time to be in the Word today. Bless our time together as we explore Mark chapter 2 and the teachings and the ministry of Jesus Christ. We give you praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, looking down, making sure the microphone is working and on. Okay, we're good. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 2. We're going to look at chapter 2, uh, most of chapter 2, and then also the first six verses of chapter 3. As I mentioned at the beginning, this lesson is talking, this, uh, it's a second lesson in a series of six lessons on uh, the gospel by uh, Mark in talking about the life of Christ. And this lesson specifically is talking about where Jesus confronts religious leaders. In today's lesson, he's going to be confronted by two scribes. And uh, a scribe is one who would copy or translate the Holy Scriptures. And so uh, they didn't have electronics like we have a Xerox machine or Canon copiers, those kinds of things. And so scribes were the individuals that would translate and copy this Holy Scriptures. Because of their intimate knowledge of the Word of God, they became known as teachers and interpreters of the law. And so in this case, in the passage we're going to see today, two scribes will confront Jesus about something he does in this second chapter. Uh, so he's going to confront uh, errors, and he's going to confront legalism, and he's going to do so with a power and authority that no one had ever really seen before. So in the lesson today, one of the first things that we take away is that as he confronts these religious leaders, that then also makes the point that Jesus was opposed by people. And so he was opposed by several people, but most frequently he was opposed by the religious leaders of the Jews. That opposition frequently brought him into conflict with the religious leaders, uh, although his teaching, his preaching, and his conduct were never ever in violation of the law of Moses. So his teaching and preaching brought him into conflict with the religious leaders, but not with the law of Moses. And I want to make that point clear. In that Jesus' teaching, his preaching, and his conduct, his behavior, were all within the law, were all within the law of Moses, all within the moral confines and guidance of the Scriptures. So that tells us then that his teaching and preaching and his ministry, his conduct, did violate the man-made rules of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, or the religious leaders of the Jews. And let me explain what that means. They had created rules and traditions in addition to the law of Moses. For example, uh, if you go to Mark chapter 7 and look at verse 13, it says, and so you counsel the word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. And this is only one example among many. So Jesus is actually speaking here. He's talking to 
uh, the, the Pharisees and teachers of the law, the scribes. And he says, you know, you, you've created so many rules around the law of God. God gave one commandment, do not kill. Uh, but you've written man-made laws to define what that meant. And you've, you've, you've put in so much additional steps that it's, you're more concerned about meeting the steps to the law than the law itself. One example that we're going to see in the lesson today is um, how that Jesus heals. And, and when he does, though, he first asks and says to the man he's about to heal, I'm going to forgive you of your sins. So let's look at that and understand it. So, so even though the Pharisees had man-made rules and laws in addition to the scriptures, we see that Jesus' teaching interacted or contradicted or opposed their additional man-made laws, but not the law of God. So this angered Jesus' opponents so much so that, that they, they contrived to kill him, to find a way they became very determined to kill Jesus. And we know in the end, they did. But that was all in fulfillment for Jesus' purpose and why he came. So this lesson today is going to focus on some of the conflicts that Jesus had with the religious leaders who opposed him. But it also tells us how Jesus handled these conflicts. And we need to know that. So today's lesson is talking about healing and forgiveness, about eating and fasting, and about the Sabbath. Now, we know historically in, uh, in the life of Christ and the lesson we talked last week that Jesus had begun a ministry or a circuit of ministry preaching and teaching in the synagogues around the area of Galilee. Galilee is the northern portion of Israel. Here's the Sea of Galilee and the city that he made his home base in was Capernaum or it means the city of Nahum. Uh, and this is the uh, ancestral home of Nahum the prophet in the Old Testament. So Jesus had, had done a uh, completing a circuit uh, of, of visiting and preaching and teaching in the synagogues in Galilee. We saw this last week in chapter 1. And so in verse 1 of chapter 2, he returns to Capernaum. So Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later. The news spread quickly that he was back home. So he's come back home, and, and his residence there was not his own home. But he stayed in the home of two brothers who were also his apostles, disciples, and that was Andrew and Peter, and their families. So they, the brothers owned a larger home in Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee where they worked, where they were fishermen, and they lived with their families there, and Jesus stayed there as well. This was his residence while he was there. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, Capernaum is the hometown of the prophet Nahum, and uh, it also is the center of all of the Jesus' ministry, teaching, and preaching in the area of Galilee. Now, <clears throat> when we move to chapter 3 and a little bit later in the third point of the lesson, uh, we talks about where he heals a man on the Sabbath. That ministry is not t typically believed to have taken place in Capernaum, but a a city, another small town or village outside of Capernaum, but still in the area of Galilee that was a little more further away from the seashore. Okay. All right. Um, let's look at chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to step out of the camera and cut my phone off. All right. I forgot to cut it off. I took it off, but forgot to cut it off. All right. All right, so let's read uh, verse 1 through 4. So when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching uh, God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring, Jesus to, they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. They then lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Okay, this is an amazing story. I love this story. It, we see that in spite of, of the opposition of many of the religious leaders, Jesus still grew or drew very large crowds of people. The multitudes, the crowds always followed Jesus. He drew crowds 
to hear his preaching, his teaching, and many of them came to be healed by him. So early in his ministry in Galilee, which is this area here, early in that time frame in that ministry, we see that he returns back to Capernaum after that circuit. A large crowd gathers in, in and around the house to hear Jesus teaching. So while he's teaching, four men bring a friend who is paralyzed on a mat. Now, he can't walk. So they bring him lying down on a mat. Well, they attempt to bring their friend to Jesus, but they can't do it because of the crowd in the house. They can't get in the front yard. They can't get through the gate hardly. They can't get into the house to see Jesus. So when they couldn't gain entrance to the house, uh, they go to the roof. Now, how you say, how in the world did they get the roof? I want you to, I want to, I want to draw a picture here. I, I know this is simplistic. I'm not trying to, to uh, uh, offend anybody, but I want you to understand, as a child would think when we tell this story, we think that they are in a house like that. And how in the world did they get to the roof and they, how could they stay up there with that man and how could they dig a hole or put a hole through the roof? Well, that's the wrong concept. They don't have houses like that in the Holy Land. Okay, Their houses are just like this. And on the outside of the house, they would have stairway. And they did a lot of work. Oftentimes they had temporary structures like a tent or a covering on the top of the roof and uh, they would do their cooking. It was cooler on the roof. They did their cooking on the roof. They even did their laundry, their wash, the drying. All of that would be done on the roof. They had flat houses. And so they have gained entrance uh, to the roof by a set of stairs that was built on the outside wall. So then they go and take a part of the roof away and they lower the man down on a mat right in front of Jesus. Now think about this. What does this show or tell us about these four friends? Well, first off, they love their friend and also they are determined that he is to see Jesus. But it also says this that they had faith in Jesus and what Jesus could do. They believed Jesus could heal this man. And so they had great faith in Jesus' ability to heal and that Jesus could do something very extraordinary. And of course, what does Jesus do? The extraordinary. Let's look at verse 5. So seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, or in the King James says, My son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law, these were the scribes I was telling you about, who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he said to them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We've never seen anything like this before. So Jesus' first statement to the paralyzed man that was let down through the roof was, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Or, My child, your sins are forgiven. Now, that's probably not what the audience expected Jesus to say. They likely expected that Jesus would just simply heal the man and... and, and uh, that's not the, the, the healing or the, the forgiveness of sins didn't enter into their thought or their thought patterns. But we see that Jesus would heal the man. But first he demonstrated 
by forgiving his sins that spiritual needs were of a greater importance. And this is what this story illustrates to us very powerfully. Yes, Jesus is concerned about our physical and our, our, our uh, mental conditions, our physical and material needs. And yet, he was more concerned about the man's spiritual condition. And so we see that, that well, think about it this way. What does it profit a man if he has material abundance, if he has physical well-being, but he loses his own soul because he has unforgiven sin? Well, this lesson shows the importance of setting priorities. Jesus knew the young man had sin that needed to be forgiven. And he saw that as a greater priority than the physical healing. Now, that doesn't mean that the healing was less important to Jesus. He healed the man. But he wanted that man to be in a right relationship. And so he forgave him his sins. So we see that Jesus had the opportunity to reveal his power to do miracles. But he also uh, had power to do miracles because of who he is. He is the eternally begotten Son of God. Now, on hearing Jesus' words of forgiveness, some scribes, and remember these scribes are those who made copies of the Scripture, they interpreted Scriptures, they became teachers of the law, and they were present, and they're thinking to themselves about what Jesus just said. He's just uh, uh, spoken blasphemy. All right? how, how can you forgive sin? You're a man. You're marrying Joseph's boy. You're, they didn't understand Jesus. They didn't have the discernment to understand that Jesus was the Son of God. And of course, Jesus is the Son of God, but they don't have that spiritual discernment to know that. So Jesus asks them, which is easier, uh, to forgive the man's sin or to heal the man? Well, Jesus actually answers his own question, and he says to them uh, that, that if I heal the man, as, uh, pr that would be proof that I have the power and authority to forgive the man's sins. And so he says, your sins are forgiven. He heals the man. And by that authority, it proves to the scribes, those that are listening. Now think about it. it the scriptures say, as we just read, that they, they thought this among themselves. They didn't verbalize it. So the crowd doesn't know. Jesus it, uh, has just read the minds of the scribes and the Pharisees. He, he knows what they're thinking. He, and they have accused him of blasphemy, but they haven't said it out loud. And so we see that he says to them that I do have the authority. So immediately the man is miraculously healed as, and just as Jesus had commanded him. So what is the response of the crowd? Well, those that are gathered, they, in verse 12 it says they glorified God. Well, Jesus forgave and he healed the man because he is the Son of God. His ministry causes, Jesus' ministry caused people to glorify God. The same is true today. When Jesus works in the lives of people, they glorify God. Jesus' ministry to the paralyzed man demonstrates that Jesus uh, or actually the priority that Jesus places on meeting the spiritual needs of the people. Anyone could see that this man needed physical healing, but Jesus is the only one in that crowd that day that could see his greater need for the forgiveness of his sins. So it may be easier for us to see that people have physical or material needs, but the, oftentimes what we can't see is the greater spiritual need and that is only apparent to God. So, this is the reason why in biblical instructions for offering prayer for those in need of physical healing, this, and it says in James chapter 5, verse 15, it says, The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. So we need to keep it in our minds that the ministry of healing also includes the ministry of the forgiveness of sins. Now, in chapter 2, verse 14, down through verse 17, we see that Jesus is questioned about eating with sinners. Verse 14. 
As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Later, Levi invited Jesus to his disciples, excuse me, later, Levi invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat? with such scum. When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not, uh, though, not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Mark tells that Jesus, while passing by a tax collector's station in the city or town of Capernaum, that Jesus called this tax collector to be his disciple, to be his follower. Now, Mark, the uh, gospel writer Mark, identifies this follower's name as Levi. But we also know that Levi is the other name for Matthew. If you go to Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, G, uh, Matthew identifies himself that way. And it says, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man by the name Matthew sitting at his tax collector booth. Follow me and be my disciple. And Jesus said to him, so Matthew got up and followed him. We also know that as a publican or a tax collector, he worked for the Roman government. And that meant that he collected for taxes for the Roman government. Like most publicans or tax collectors, it appears that he was wealthy and that he hosted a large feast in Jesus' honor in his home. And we saw that in verse 15. Now, among the guests that are at this feast, there were many publicans or other tax collectors and sinners. Now, many of the Jews regarded publicans as the worst of the worst, the worst of sinners because they worked for the Roman government collecting taxes from the Jews. Now, while some scribes and Pharisees saw Jesus eating with publicans and sinners, they were really highly critical of him. But Jesus, hearing what they were saying, instructed them that he had come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In other words, does a doctor go to those that are healthy or does he go to those that are sick? Jesus did not condone, nor did he participate in the sin of the sinners that were at that dinner. And he did not necessarily associate with them socially in that sense. Jesus befriended sinners so that he could influence them to repent and turn from their sinning back toward God. So in this way, Jesus gave an example of how and why believers in him should befriend sinners. You should befriend a sinner just simply to participate in their social activities. But you should, you should befriend a sinner to show them the love of Jesus Christ. Now, look at verse 18 through 22. And let's read that together. Once when Jesus' disciples, excuse me, once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, Why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples and the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, Do wedding guests fast while they're celebrating with the groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them, but someday the groom will be taken away from them, and they, then they will fast. Notice uh, down through verse 21, 22 also. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new clothing? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. For the wine would burst the wine skins, and the wine in the skins both be lost. New wine calls for new wine skins. Here we have a 
discussion on fasting. On the heels of his confrontation with the scribes and the Pharisees over Jesus befriending sinners, Mark says that some of the disciples of John the Baptist, along with some Pharisees, had come and questioned Jesus about why his disciples did not fast as they, the disciples of John the Baptist, or even the Pharisees did. So Jesus uses uh, figurative language here to answer uh, those that are asking him the questions. He said that the attendants of a bridegroom do not fast while the bridegroom is still feasting with them. And then afterwards, he says, when the bridegroom is taken from them, then the attendants fast. So we know and understand here that Jesus is referring to the fact that he is still with his disciples. But he would be taken from them. And when he's taken from them, then his disciples would then fast. Now, there was only one fast for the Jews commanded by the law of Moses. And that was on the annual day of atonement. This is found in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 26 through 32. All other prescribed fasts, hear me here, all other prescribed fasts were created by religious and civil leaders of the Jews. Right? The disciples of John fasted often. We see that in Luke 5. 33. The Pharisees fasted twice in the week, according to Luke 18, 11, and 12. In Israel's ancient history, as told in the Bible, fasting, other than on the Day of Atonement, had been practiced in times of great distress when they were seeking God's help in prayer. So Jesus said, in effect, that after his departure, verse 20, there would be times when his disciples would uh, uh, know that there is a need to fast and they would fast and they would pray. Okay. Now notice Jesus concludes his answer about fasting with two very short parables that shed light on the reason for the conflict between himself and the religious practitioners of his day. As believers in Jesus... We are called by God to be holy by living in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This we can do by faith and grace with the help of God's Word and God's Holy Spirit. But we are to never be self-righteous. Many of the religious leaders of Jesus' time, self-righteousness will cause us to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, believing that our own good works make us much better than others, that God is the debtor, that we, uh, God owes us something because of our works. Nothing can be further from the truth. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 3.23, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the importance of the present tense use of come short is that it reveals our ongoing inability to attain righteousness by our own efforts. We have a need of the continuous life transforming work of Jesus Christ to be applied in our lives and through the power of his word and his Holy Spirit. Only as we recognize and appropriate this truth in our lives will we be found to have the righteousness which is of God by faith, in Philippians 3, 9 tells us. Now, looking at the third point of the lesson, talking about the Sabbath, let's read verse 23 down through chapter 3, verse 6. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why are you breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them, Haven't you read in the Scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? 
he went into the house of God during the days when Abathar was high priest and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Jesus went in to the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed... Well, let's stop here. Let's talk about the Sabbath. Then we'll talk about his healing on the Sabbath. So notice that Jesus is saying in his passage that the Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. So Mark is telling us in this latter part of chapter 2... He's telling us of a time when Jesus and his disciples were passing through some grain fields on the Sabbath. And there was rules about how far you could travel and walk about a half a mile on the Sabbath day, what was known as a Sabbath day's journey. Well, as they going through the field, Jesus' disciples plucked some of the ripe heads of grain uh, and, and, um, and ate them. Now, what they were doing was permitted by the law of Moses. You'll see this in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25. Now, the Pharisees saw this happen, happen and they criticized Jesus' disciples, saying that it was not lawful for them to do this on the Sabbath. Well, the scribes and the Pharisees, being aware of the Babylonian captivity of the Jews between 606 and and 536 B.C., and they knew that that captivity had lasted 70 years, and they also knew that that captivity was because of the Israelites' centuries-long failure to observe the Sabbath. If you go to 20, Jeremiah 29.10, 2 Chronicles 36.21, we know that Israel, part of the reason that she had gone into captivity for their idolatry, but they did not observe the Sabbath, and so they were 490 years worth. And so you, you divide that by 70, you get 70 years, or 7 times 70, you get 70 years. And so what happened here is we see that they, the Pharisees and the scribes, they had concocted hundreds of rules for the Sabbath observance. Why? So that they would ensure that no judgment would fall like the Babylonian judgment. In other words, no judgment of God would fall on them again. Now, the problem with those rules is this, that the rules for observing the Sabbath were so many and so difficult to keep, it basically became impossible for conscientious Jews to observe the Sabbath as the scribes and the Pharisees required. Now, remember... We've already said that there was only one occasion where they were permitted to fast. And we know that Jesus' disciples were told, uh, were legally by the law of Moses, walking through the grain field and eating the grain. They could do that by according to the law. But so what law were they breaking? The law of Moses or the rules that set by man? The disciples were accused of dishonoring the Sabbath because they were breaking man-made rules, not God's law regarding the Sabbath. So, Jesus replies to the critics of his disciples by citing an occasion when David violated a rule about who could eat the showbread by having his hungry soldiers fed with the showbread from the temple in 1 Samuel. Now, Jesus placed the law of human need above ritual observance. Let me repeat that. Jesus placed the law of human need above ritual observance. But then Jesus calls attention to the fact that humans were created before the Sabbath, and therefore God made the Sabbath for humans, all right, not humans for the Sabbath, verse 27. Think about it. Think about the order of creation. Man was made before the Sabbath was made. So therefore, the Sabbath is made for man. Man is to work for six days and rest on the seventh. So the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Notice here that God established it as that day of rest 
as a day for humans to rest, as a day for work animals to rest. Okay? It was not to be a miserable but a day of laboring to keep man-made rules. Now notice in verse 28, Jesus identifies himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. This means that he, along with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, had established the Sabbath, and no one better knew better than he himself, because he created it. Now, let's look at another event on the Sabbath day, looking at chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was on the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, Come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? Notice the scriptures say, But they wouldn't answer him because they knew the truth. They knew what the law said, but they were more concerned about their man-made rules than God's rule. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, Hold out your hand. And so the man held out his hand, and it was restored. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how they could kill Jesus. Here Mark tells us of another occasion when Jesus had entered into the synagogue and he was found there or found there a man who had a shriveled or deformed hand. All right? There are those that were present then that watched to see. Pharisees probably followed Jesus specifically on the Sabbath days to see what Jesus would do so they could accuse him of some violation. Now we know that they are there. Verses 1 and 2 tell us that they're there, and they're looking to see if they can find something they can accuse him. Why? Because they want to kill him. Jesus was teaching the truth of the Old Testament law, the moral convictions of the law, and yet it was going against the man-made laws of the Pharisees. So, notice that, that according to the rules by the scribes and the Pharisees, healing was labor. And so, therefore, you shouldn't heal on the Sabbath. So Jesus inquired of his critics. He inquired of the Sadducees and the Pharisees if it was good to do good on the Sabbath, verse 4, uh, and, or to do evil. And with this said, then Jesus, with very visible and justified anger toward his critics, healed the man with the shriveled, deformed hand. For this very good deed done on the Sabbath, Jesus' critics made plans to murder him. Think about that. Because Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath, what does that tell you about the, the scribes and the Pharisees? They did not care for their fellow man. They only wanted to be observed, uh, their rules to be observed. They did not have love. They did not care for the people. Uh, they were only looking to their own self-righteousness. So Jesus is now considered a marked man by them, and they are finding, trying to find an opportunity, make plans uh, to murder Jesus. Now, we know in verse 7, which I didn't read, it says, Jesus went out to the lake with his disciples, and a large crowd followed him, and they all came from over Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, Idumea, from east of the Jordan River, and even as far north as Tyre and Sidon, all the way up into Syria. The news about his miracles had spread far and wide, and vast numbers of people came to see him. Jesus has gone to the seashore to travel. So Jesus, we see that Jesus and his disciples uh, are leaving that place and they return back over to the coastal region over by the Sea of Galilee. Here's what I want us to take home from this. God's command, excuse me, God commands that when it comes to obeying His Word, 
we must not turn to the left or to the right. We know this in Deuteronomy 28, 14 and Joshua 1, 7. In other words, we are not to go beyond what God has commanded to establish our own righteousness, <coughs> nor shall we grant ourselves liberty to do less than God requires. Think about that for a moment. If we move either right or we move left away from simply believing and obeying God's word, we cease to live by grace and faith and whatever is not of faith, Romans 14, 23 tells us, is sin. So the scribes and the Pharisees in Jesus' time, by doing and going about uh, to establish their own righteousness, made them sinners and made them hypocrites. <coughs> okay, Here's what it is. They didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't recognize Him and believe Him to be the Son of God. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's important for us to strive for Christ-likeness, in other words, holiness of lifestyle, by grace, through faith, and we should avoid at all costs self-righteousness, like the scribes and the Pharisees. Christ's call to us today is to be His disciples. It's a call to believe. It's a call to obey. It's to follow His example and to never stop trusting in Him to give us the grace to do these very things. That's the neat thing about God. God asks us uh, to follow Him. He gives us the power and the grace and the ability, the authority and the ability to do it. He doesn't ask us to do it on our own. He gives us the ability to do those things. So today I challenge you to think about your time with God, to commit yourselves to studying God's Word regarding your, your faith and your practices, your beliefs. And I want you to be sure that what you believe and what you practice is, in fact, consistent with God's Word. We see that the Pharisees and the scribes believe things beyond the Word. They added all these extra laws to the Sabbath. The, 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 the law of Moses prescribed for one fast in a year. One fast in the law. They fasted weekly. Right? They set rules about how to fast, what to eat, what to not eat, what to do, what, and all these rules about what to do and what you couldn't do, how far you could walk, how far you couldn't walk on the Sabbath, etc., etc. The Bible gave and said the Sabbath is for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes turned it around. They turned it back into something about themselves and their obedience to rules not to the law of God. And so we, I challenge you today to think about your beliefs and your practices and are they consistent with the Word of God? And allow, if they're not, then allow the Word of God to give you direction and, and make sure that, it, and, and if need be, repent of self-righteousness and get your account clear with God. So I, I pray today, Holy Spirit, that you would take this Word and Father, Lord, that you would help us to apply it boldly and profoundly to our lives. Help us, Lord, to not um, just consider our own righteousness, but Lord, that we would look at, to the righteousness of Christ. Lord, that we would not, um, uh, well, actually, maybe, Lord, we should evaluate our own beliefs and our own practices and make sure that it lines up with Scripture. And Lord, if, there, if there's anything there in our, our belief or practices that's not of God's Word, then give us the discernment, give us the ability to change that. Father, Lord, help us not to be like the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, but help us, Lord Jesus, to, to um, not create our own rules for Sabbath observance or in any way to think that we are um, generating our own righteousness. Forgive us of that, Father. Cleanse us from that. Help us to walk in your law. Help us to walk in your word. Help us to walk by your spirit. Give us sensitivity, Father Lord, to that in our own lives and to the lives of others. Father Lord, by your Holy Spirit, we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. All right. The Lord bless you, and we'll see you next Sunday. 
which will be February the 7th, lesson number 10. The Lord bless you.